until my, my protege is not to do. I waited and wondered what would happen. Well, I got a phone call asking me when I could be interviewed. I went, oh, that's good. That's really good. Then I got really, really nervous. I was gobbling up every piece of information I could about the Commission on the Status of Women. I was gobbling up every piece of information about gender equity across the world. And I was interviewed. Now, you probably gather that I like a chat. Can be a bit cheeky, it's the hair. Um, and so what do you think happened? They asked me the one question that I had to give the smiley pants answer to. And that question was, and what do you do in civil society? My response was, I live in it. <laughs> and I suddenly went, oh hell, that's not the right answer. So I quickly backpedaled very fast and started to talk about my involvement with She Next Tech and that we're looking to address the underrepresentation of the women in the tech workforce globally, that I'm all for the empowerment of rural women and girls and have worked my whole life towards that. And I, I think the backpedaling was, and I'm a Zonchin, so that also helped. And so I think that backpedaling helped because about three days later, one of my referees ran in and said, well, you're in. What do you mean I'm in? I said, well, the referee checked you. And he said, quite honestly, and this man has a terrific title. He's Deputy Director General of the Department of Communities in Queensland. Right? And my coordinator. So great title. And I think that impressed Canberra. So he said, oh, I basically told him that the man not to take you. So the moral of the story, ladies and gentlemen, is make sure you have referees who are prepared to lie for you. <laughs> <laughs> Weeks went by and I thought, well, that's the end of that. Well, I've given it a crack. I've given it a crack. I feel good I've given it a crack and it was, I know it was hotly sought after. On the 9th of November, I got a phone call saying, uh, have you changed your trip to New York? I said, pardon? Yes, this is the Office for Women, Director of International Engagement, you're coming to New York with us. I cried. <laughs> and I suddenly thought, this is what a seven-year-old kid from the bush wanted to do. I wanted to go to the UN. And I'm going to go. Oh my God, this is just amazing. So, off we went. We were under embargo, by the way. There was a change of ministers, and there was a reshuffling cabinet, and goodness knows what else happened. We were under embargo. We could not speak about this for three and a half months. The other thing is make sure that the people that you tell are trustworthy. Because I kept thinking, this thing is getting longer. I'm going to have to tell people why I'm not going to be around for those three weeks in March. They're going to think I'm mad. And so I had to keep making up stories. So my husband knew, my referees knew, and, and so my boss knew. And so at the time I was thinking, you know what? Somebody is going to let this cat out of the bag and I won't go at all. But again, Make sure that they won't tell those people you trust won't tell where the bodies are buried. <laughs> Got to New York City. What I didn't know was that the first thing on my uh, agenda was to be an afternoon tea with the Australian Permanent Ambassador to the United Nations, Jimmy Bird. And that was terrific, so we went to her residence. And this is her residence. Um, beautiful. So we're sitting around, and there's, there's the commissioner, on the, uh, there's the commissioner, there's the minister, the ambassador, uh, ambassador for women and girls. There's uh, three commissioners, some very high-powered women from um, DFAT, and the office for women, prime minister and cabinet, and me and one other civil society rep. What I didn't know was that we were going to have to speak. And June Oscar, who is the uh, Commissioner for Social Justice for Indigenous People, is absolutely amazing. She spoke first and I had to go after her. Thank God for June sitting across the table from me because she did the whole the right body language stuff, very encouraging, a little smile here, a little smile there. And I managed to get through it. And if it weren't for her, I'd probably be in a mess. So I thanked her and I picked up my teacup and each one of those cups in gold leaf has the, has the um, coat of arms in Australia on it. So I picked my cup up, <laughs> wishing it was gin. I had a little drink. Absolutely delighted 
so that that card went off work. <coughs> we walked straight from there directly to um, the consulate in order, which was our home away from home for two and a half weeks. How special is that? If we wanted to go and read Australian newspapers, that's where we'd go. Um, believe we decided not to. So that was a, a, a reception where we met all the other Australians who were going to be on the ground. In New York, some four and a half thousand women come together from across the world. All 193 member states are represented. And then, it was day one. Where I'm standing with the red, uh, or the cranberry coloured scarf, um, is the coldest place in the entire universe. It had not snowed in New York for three weeks, but there were blocks of snow and ice on the ground. There is a wind that whips off the east river there that would go straight through you. That's why I'm grimacing. <laughs> but that was our first day at work, and how special was it for me to walk through the di diplomatic pass, through the diplomatic entrance to the United Nations, which is an incredible place to be. We walked through the Hall of Flags, which you've all seen on television, and the director, uh, who was um, second in charge of the delegation, turned to me and said, if you don't cry when you walk through this door, I'll be really disappointed. <laughs> Anybody think I cry? Well, I actually don't. But it was, I would step through that portal onto the floor of the General Assembly of the United Nations in New York City. And yes, there was a tear. Until three seconds later, I hear, oh, mad crazy Australians that I've met the night before up in the general gallery. How Australian is that? <laughs> so my role was to be conduit because we were going to negotiate a position for rural women and girls, the empowerment of rural women and girls through the use of technology. Now when you're at the United Nations, you need to make sure that all 193 member states agree and my role was to be the conduit between civil society who are out in the hall and not allowed into the negotiating room and with our negotiating team who are diplomats. Amazing. One of the other things that we decided that very first morning, we had a morning muster every morning we'd get together and we'd determine who needed to do what when. One of the things that we determined was that we would never leave the Australia desk unstaffed at any time. There will always be somebody on that out of respect for our country and out of respect for the Commission. So on day one, look who ends up having to sit at the desk. <laughs> Alone and without a leader, as one poll would say. Quite amazing. And I was thinking, please God, please God, do not ask me a hard question. <laughs> Otherwise I'd never have to remember this and say, I need to take that notice. <laughs> Fortunately, nothing came my way, but what did happen that morning, which was incredibly, incredibly profound for me, was that the Secretary General of the UN, who was a man, during his opening of the session said, I am a committed feminist. We need to take the power, otherwise we will be living in a male-dominated world forever. Bear in mind that the United Nations tells us that it will be 213 years before we get gender equality across the world. That's a big ask. So we went on to try and empower rural women and girls. We start off with what's called a zero draft of agreed conclusions. These are the things that we would like to see at the end of the day. Bless you. At the end of the day, or at the end of the two weeks. So we have negotiated this. So and what we're doing is this is global, so we are actually looking to put a global position in place for those 193 member states to then put the right legislation in place back home. And then there's a check-in point every 12 months when you go back to the commission where your country has to stand up and make a statement as to where they're up to. So that's what we were looking to do. And these sessions would go long into the night. And Sonia knows very well that I travel with a very good friend of mine who's been travelling with me for 25 years, Gus the Travelling Bear. He actually got the Minister's permission to come with us and he came into one of the night sessions with me and you can see he's just he's listening to the translation there, making a few notes. 
My friend, I have to tell you, who was from uh, Iceland, lovely man from Iceland, uh, took quite a fancy to who, what he called the gentleman there. So he makes another appearance. So long into the night, you break into groups to deal with some of the issues that are hard issues. Like, let me give you one. Protections for female rights uh, advocates or human rights advocates in the field. Having that discussion, we had a particular country, who shall remain nameless, stand up and say, that is a red line issue for us. A red line means you can go no further, and if one member state has a red line, there are no agreed conclusions. We've just wasted two weeks of our time. So, I will tell you that a wonderful man from Brazil, one of their diplomats, took the floor, which is called take, making an intervention. He made an intervention and said, I want to tell you a story. I have a good friend, Mary Ellen Franco, who is a human rights defender in the field. She was brutally beaten two nights ago and I had just had a message on my phone to say that she has just died. This is why we need to defend these women in the field. Well, our mate who can't call the red line is looking a bit dodgy at that point. So the convener said, uh, I think we might take a break and break into bilateral groups. So that means that it looked to me like they were taking outside and beat the hell out of them <laughs> until they got the right decision. And I said to the first secretary of our mission, I said, oh, another job. So, Joe, what's going to happen? They're going to give them a good thumping out. No, no, she said it's a bit of a verbal. They'll take them through so many statistics, you'll end up having to say yes at some point. So, what happens when you break, it's three o'clock in the morning and you break into these bilateral, multilateral groups? Not everybody has something to do. Look closely. The lady with the White coat over her, first secretary from DFAT, thank you very much. The lady lounging over here with a knee in the air, senior diplomat from Switzerland. The African ladies were having a bit of a chat. Norway up the back is awake, but nobody else is the rest all along the north. So it's a great opportunity for photographs, I have to tell you. <laughs> We'll come back to what happened with that fellow who called the red line a little later. So this is what happened where I was sitting. My friend from Iceland, Barty, decided that it was time that the bear not only had a listen, but that he actually addressed the assembly. And he said, we don't want to take photos, take photos, he's not going to get this chance again in the So he did. So after some very hairy, very hairy uh, discussions, with five minutes to go before the final gavel, what do you reckon happened? Our little buddy from the Red Lion Nation stood up and said, I have spoken to capital, which means he had spoken to his capital city back home. This is a really oppressive regime, I just say as well, and he said, we have determined that we will agree the reference, which means he is agreeing to move forward on the human rights defence. Now, there was a real concern from the Australian and New Zealand contingent because no one thinks he actually called capital. They think that he actually made that decision unilaterally, which means he may very well be in the equivalent of a gulag when he gets home. And eventually, at five minutes to four, on Friday the 23rd of March last year, the gavel went down, which meant that all 42 pages of agreed conclusions were agreed by all 193 member states. That's enormous diplomacy, and Australia leads the way in diplomacy in these efforts. The room went mad. It erupted. There were 450 people in that room and everyone was hugging and kissing. And I don't know, I was hugging an African woman's name. I still don't know. <laughs> but we were so delighted. She and I were both crying. I thought I'd be relieved because it was very stressful. 
but it was more than relief. It was sheer joy, because I looked at this woman and said, we have made a difference. So a brief conclusions, what happens next? Well, from, from I've said, all those countries go home, they look at the legislation, and they do some work, and we have to all go back again in a couple of months' time and, and start those discussions on a different theme, and there will be six years allowed for the last theme. So for me, it's been rolling out the program and my learnings across the world. I've been lucky enough to be in India, South Africa, Lusaka, and uh, sorry, Zambia and uh, Kenya this year, this is past year as a result of that. So it's been really extraordinary. But for me, it's about not my generation or the next generation below that. It's the 11 year olds that we need to be capturing their hearts and minds so they don't suffer in the same way that some of us women have suffered uh, with inequality in the workplace, particularly in the technology workplace. So that's where my thinking is now, and I was a little young lady up there who I think you know, um, who is 11, and the photo was taken. She is a South Australian I award winner in the junior category, which is huge. So if I can help those women, young women and girls, then I will. I think I've actually found my niche in the world, which is to help and empower women and girls. With that, I will just say this much, that quite honestly, I believe that we can all fly on our own wings. However, there are times when Mr. Qantas or Mr. American Airlines has to help me. <laughs> and you can see even the bear has had to turn up in the cockpit, if you don't mind. That's an A380. So with that, I guess just to finish, I'd like to say, tell your daughters, your granddaughters, your nieces, Anybody that you can that do dream, dream big and believe in those dreams and believe in yourself because dreams do come true. Thank you.
comment on it. You, you finalised and finished your presentation with the thought about aiming high, dreaming big, and so on, with an emphasis on young women, 11 year old women. In the interest of keeping the pendulum uh, from swinging too far or one way or the other, would that apply to young men as well, do you think? I think everybody needs to dream big. I just think that young women, as I've said, don't necessarily believe in themselves. If men do, young men believe far more in themselves than young women. And it's just a, it's one of those things that I see every single day. And so that's why I encourage young women. Um, and we see that also graduates coming into the workplace. Uh, and we see the inequities and the bias, the unconscious bias that exists. And I guess that's one of the things that I'm working on is the unconscious bias. Um, and so that's one of the things. If we looked at that, I don't know that anybody saw the Gillette ads that just come out about. Um, and I actually think those ads are quite powerful because what they're actually saying is it's be the best man that you can be. And that means taking the bias out when you're dealing with, with other genders. Yes? Thank you for your presentation, very interesting. Um, when you meet again, Three months, did you say? Uh, in March, I, I arrived back in New York, March the 8th. Okay. Um, and you reviewed the progress which has been made over the past four months. Uh, what will you regard as your key performance indicator? It's not my key performance indicator, it's that of the government. Don't forget, we're, we're, I'm, I'm non government. Um, but it's certainly the government will, will make um, a country statement on where they believe they are. And believe me, um, I'm part of, the, I'm also on the board of the National Rural Women's Coalition. And believe me, we keep them honest as to what they report. So we will actually see a draft before it go, before it's actually made at the UN. So if we don't believe, and it's not just the National Rural Women's Coalition, there are women's alliances around Australia. If we don't believe that it's accurate, we will certainly make that statement. We have input every um, uh, stage along the way, including the zero drafts and the, and the various drafts of the agreed conclusions as well. So that's how we do it. We keep it honest. Thank you for that talk. Very interesting. But what is the cultural prison? that you and your colleagues at the UN are working through. If I look at the Sudan, they have quite a different view as to how society should operate. And many other undeveloped countries, and how are they held to account? They are held to account in the same way. They have to make a country state. It's interesting when it comes to some of the countries in Africa, because they band together in what's called, interesting enough, Africa group. So they will make a joint statement to the UN. There's the Arab group, there's the Santa Domingo group, there are, there's the Pacific Island Forum. So there are particular groups that will make both their country statements. But they are held to account in the same way. One of the things that's happened just recently, talking about Africa, in Liberia, uh, where the president who was outgoing female president after 12 years has just made uh, female neuter general mutilation illegal for the first time. Incredibly brave thing for her to have done. So she, she was actually living up to one of those tenants that we agreed last March. Thank you so much, Jo. I thoroughly enjoyed that, that, that wonderful presentation. Um, this is a bit light-hearted, going back to Audrey Hepburn. <laughs> um, these days, uh, we do still see uh, famous people that are being um, uh, uh, given roles within the UN as ambassadors. Um, Angelina Jolie, um, the, um, the young girl from Harry Potter and Hermione. <laughs> um, and I'm just wondering if on March the 8th, which is International Women's Day, uh, what's going to happen at the United Nations to celebrate that and if there will be any any high-profile people there to run? Uh, that's a good question. We, the programs are only just coming out now, so I hope I can let you know. But let me just leave this with you. One of those young women who are now uh, very influential is Meghan Markle, the Duchess of Sussex. And when she addressed the UN last uh, May of March the 8th, 
She said, it is said that girls with dreams become women with vision. May we empower each other to carry out such vision because it isn't enough to simply talk equality, one must believe in it. And it isn't enough to simply believe in it, one must work at it. Let us work at it together, starting now. That's my call to action for you all as well. Thank you, Joe. Here's a small token of our appreciation from the club. Thank you once again.